Welcome to Grumpy Vegan Grandad. It is a beautiful, crisp, snowy day out there in northwestern land. And um, today is answer your questions. Once again, I've had some belters, but I'd like to start by just um, giving you guys the heads up about this latest study that's popped up on my feed from um, Lift Kindly. Yep, Live Kindly. You can subscribe to these, you get some great news. I'll put a link in the comments below. Um, yeah, it's pretty, makes for pretty grim reading. Um, what it's saying is one third of plant and animal species could be wiped out in 50 years time, according to new research. A new study conducted at the University of Arizona looked at data from 538 species in 581 places around the world. 44% had already gone extinct at one or more of the places they had early inhabited. This is called local extinction. So it goes through and talks a little bit about it. Um, but what they're saying here is that uh, according to Professor John J. Wines of the Uni University of Arizona, the new research is unique in a number of different ways. It utilizes information from local extinctions that have, ho that have already happened, not simply projecting what is going to happen in the future. So they're not guessing. It also estimates how quickly species can move to try and stay within tolerable climatic conditions based in based on how quickly they've moved in the recent past. So what they're saying is if, if it gets a bit of cold, they might move south or north, depending on where they are on, on the side of the equator. But if they can't do this, then basically they're screwed. Um, and as we scroll down... Um, it seems that the tropics are the major risk because tropics uh, are more sensitive to rising temperatures and they're adapted to a very narrow band of climate change. Uh, whereas like in the UK, we can get extremely hot summers, extremely cold winters. So these are the most at risk. Um, what is causing it? Um, greenhouse gases, of course, we all know what's causing it. Um, but it says here, one of the biggest things a person can do to reduce the carbon footprint and overall impact on the planet is to go vegan. <clears throat> well, there it is. Um, as, as well as greenhouse gas emissions, the meat and dairy industries are responsible, responsible for huge amounts of deforestation. So it's basically saying what we already knew. Well, most of us... Um, is there any more information there? The greenhouse gas footprint of animal, animal agri agriculture rivals that of every car, truck, bus, ship, airplane and a rocket ship combined. There is, there is no pathway to achieve the Paris climate objectives without a massive decrease in the scale of animal agriculture. So it's got to be done. It's got to be done. Um... According to Global Environmental Movement, the Extinction Rebellion, we could be in the middle of a, the sixth mass extinction in the Earth's history. Uh, in the last 450 million years, that, um, that have been five mass extinctions, each of those caused by natural disasters. As species go extinct, the impact of the planet is huge. Mass coral die-offs, for example, are catastrophic for underwater life. The tropical fish that rely on them for survival will also die out and the entire ecosystem crashes. It's not good, is it? It's not good. Uh, three out of four crops that produce fruits or seeds depend on pollinators, the most common of which are bees, butterflies and hoverflies. They support the production of 87% of the leading food crops around the world. According to Professor Dave Goulson from the University of Sussex, losing pollinators should be a huge concern to, concern to all of us. 
Love them or love them or loathe them. We human humans cannot survive without insects. Well, we know this. So, yeah, if you want to read that, like I said, I'll, I'll link it down below. But they're telling us something we already know. But they're also telling us that it's it's looking definite. It's looking definite. Anyways, let's have a look at your questions. And we start off with Cat Down the Road. Hello, Cat Down the Road. Why can't all humans just be nice to each other and non-humans? Or are we all just bastards deep down? Well, Cat, I can safely say that I'm a total bastard. However, I don't hate animals. I just hate the human race um, at the moment. Not happy. I'm not happy with us at all. We're not being very good, are we? And if things keep going like they are doing, we're not going to last much longer, are we? Which might be a good thing for the planet. What makes us human? What makes us human? The ability to be compassionate and be empathetic and put ourselves in the in the shoes of other people or other things. That's what makes us human. This is why I don't get why when people see the, the suffering and the harm we do to animals that we can't use. Why don't we use this ability that humans have got that animals don't, as far as we know, don't have this ability is to put ourselves in the other person's position and see it from their perspective. That's what makes us human. So how are we how are we blocking this this ability that makes us innately human? It's weird, isn't it? Nikki Rivenine, hello Nikki. Do you think there will be smart cities and rewilding in the future? I'm not going to live in a smart city. I have a dumb phone. <laughs> My family think I'm strange, yeah, same here, in that I dislike an AI quantum future. Right, okay, so we've got smart motorways now, yeah, smart motorways that will keep the flow of traffic going. They're not smart, it's fucking bollocks. So I don't think smart cities are going to be happening any anytime soon and we have to get smarter anyway so i don't know rewilding in the future i think that's a biggie i think rewilding is is going to be um <clears throat> a hot topic in the next 10 years i mean like this this um as people start cutting down on meat consumption as as less and less farms, as the farms shut down and maybe not get used again for, for arable or whatever because it's not, not the good land for it. <clears throat> we may have to reintroduce predators, may have to reintroduce um, grazing animals <clears throat> um, and, and recreate, the, yeah, recreate the, um, the, the, the natural wild um, elements of our country because the only reason that certain animals become pests is because they affect the animal livestock. They're a threat to animal livestock. Or they become a pest because their natural habitat has been destroyed and they move into cities and move into um, urban areas. And, and that's what makes them become pests. It's only due to animal agriculture that these pests have become pests. So maybe introducing wolves, um, boars, um, um, to help with the deer problems and all this stuff, and yeah, it's we've we've got to be smart now. We've got to we've got to rewild them, and, and of course, if if eventually 
the whole world goes vegan. Then we've got 75% of the landmass to um, rewild, so that'd be a cool thing. Can you imagine all that being reforested? 75%? Just think about that for a minute. That's a big area of land. It doesn't even, I can't even comprehend 75% of the of the world's landmass being being given back to nature. It's just such a, oh man. <clears throat> Sam Wingender, I love that name, Wingender, Wingender. Should parents force their kids not to eat animals? We already force our beliefs onto them saying animal cruelty is wrong. And if they came home from a friends with dog meat, we wouldn't allow it. But if it's pig meat or cow meat, we might allow it only because society says it's somehow different. Well, yeah. Um... <laughs> When you say, Sam, should we should parents force their kids not to eat animals? I'd rephrase that. We should not introduce animals to children as food. Uh, or maybe we should introduce the food to them and tell them where it comes from. But <clears throat> no, I don't think we should give children any animal products while they're growing up. And then when they hit the teens, they can make their own choices. Until, I don't think it's fair to, <clears throat> to, because you are pushing something. I've said this before, I've said this before, and we are born vegan. We are born vegan. It's not natural behavior to eat animals. So therefore, by introducing animal products to children we are forcing beliefs on them it's the same with the um on the health side of it it's the same with the um the the heart disease and stroke runs in my family no heart disease and stroke does not run in your family it's because you have the same diet that your parents and grandparents and great-grandparents had and it's been passed down bad habits passed down through the families and that's heart disease and strokes aren't hereditary they're not hereditary there might be a few odd cases genetically but your common heart disease common stroke is not hereditary it's 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 a disease brought on by diets full stop and what's that diet correct so yeah, um, and yeah, we know we know this this thing about pets, uh, friends, and pigs, chickens, cows, sheep, a food. It's these comparisons are going to start fading. They really are. So um, yeah, thanks for that, Sam. Helen Hawley, hello, Helen. If you could live anywhere in the world, where would it be and why? And what would your occupation be? I'd love to live in Bali because a few friends have gone over there and they said it's absolutely amazing. The the vegan food out there is just, well, the natural food out there because it, it's beautiful fruits, beautiful vegetables. Um, it's a beautiful place. I'd love. I haven't visited yet. I'd love to visit Bali. I ain't going too too soon anyway because like. I, I haven't worked for like three weeks now. I'm on my ass at the moment. It's killing me. The HGV industry dies at this time of year and phew, God, I've had the mortgage. Oh, anyway, you don't want to hear about my problems. So yeah, what would my occupation be there? I would love to to run um like a hotel. You know, like a like a not not so much a hotel a concrete thingy, but like, you know, like little little shacks to and in the middle of, of of the rainforest of the jungle and and just like let people just relax and play beautiful music at night and and just yeah massage and a, a lovely lovely natural pool spring um trips to go and see animals and um maybe somewhere where we could bring meat eaters and get them to to try a vegan diet for two weeks or even people who are overweight and get them to sort of try the whole food vegan diet for two weeks and, and just watch the fat drop off them and 
and just let them experience what it's like to feel good and compassionate. Yeah, thanks for that, Helen. I was just in Bali then for a minute. John Ross. How are you, mate? How long is a piece of string? Seven inches. Were the moon landings fake? I don't know. I don't really care. <laughs> they did all that. They spent all that money to go and stand on a piece of rock with nothing there. It's like going... It's like me... Spending a shitload of money to go to Bogner Regis. <laughs> Is this it? <sighs> oh, who stole that sentiment from me in in ninety six? It was uh, a lad called um, Fast Bob, um, the pickpocket. Um, I think he spent it in the weather spoons. Is there a god now? Right. Logically vegan, logically vegan, hello. Um, oh dear, right, okay. I'd like to get your layman's opinion on morality. How do you know I'm not an expert? I'd like to get your layman's opinion on morality, empathy, etc. As it relates to genetics does it? and ethical veganism. Assume that there is a particular gene or gene sequence structuring that predetermines the degree of compassion or in this particular scenario indifference a person innately acknowledges with regard to animal product consumption and by extension to the horrors of animal farming oh right okay yeah i've read that a little bit wrong um a person innately acknowledges with regard to animal products consumption and by the extension to the horrors of animal farming this is similar to genetic studies conducted on psychopathy Psychopathy, psych, psychopathy, 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 and let's also suppose that well over 90% of humanity is predisposed to this moral reasoning of indifference. Would it be logical to presume that most of these people would consider ethical vegans as tiny, slightly irritating impediments to their dietary preferences, and as such, our attempts to change their minds about the morality of consuming animal products virtually futile. Also, since it seems clear to me that most people don't really get, give a damn about the health when it comes to the animal eating desires or about the environmental environment in general, are vegan animal rights activists just spitting into the wind? That will never change direction. Moreover, given all this speculation, and recognising that there are certainly more like us who will see the ethical vegan light, could our numbers ever rise enough to make a significant difference at all? By the way, I just started thinking about this stuff two days ago, and you were the first one I ever approached on this subject. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that, Logically Vegan. So let's let's try and, try and break it up now. Um, so is it... Is it gen is it a gene? Is it genetic? Well, yes, there are psychopaths in society. And there's also a lot of other things. The brain is very, very complex. And we could we could say that certain people have no empathy, but that's a very small percentage. And I don't think this applies to to most of the population. Um so most people when you let's let, let's put the when people put a picture of them with the gun and this they got the the foot on the wild animal's head most people will absolutely kick off about that or it, a video on facebook of somebody hitting a cart or beating a down on a dog people will kick off they get an emotional response so it's there the compassion is there however what i think happens now this happened in nazi germany they you they had um, a whole section of government committed to propaganda which is basically feeding information to people whether it be lies or or truth to get them to think in a certain way and it works. And when you consider that we are 
conditioned from birth by the people we trust the most, our parents. And we are told if you don't eat that meat, you won't grow up to be big and strong. If you don't drink that milk, you, you your bones will be weak. For what is, what, a quarter of our lives, up until we're into our mid-20s, we we fed this by our parents and... It's a very, very strong form of brainwashing. Very, very strong and very... It's, it, it lasted over 40 years with me before I broke free from it. So I would say, no, I don't think... Um, humanity is predisposed to, to this indifference. I don't think it is. What I think it is, is... is, is the, if you consider it a muscle, yeah... Let's consider, let's consider the brain, the bicep, yeah? And the bigger the bicep, the, the, the more, the more our empathy disappears. So all through our life, we're, we're curling, we're curling, we're curling these weights. You know what I mean? It gets bigger, it gets stronger. And, and then it's there, the muscle's there because we keep getting, getting fed. We keep getting handed the dumbbell. We keep getting, getting hit with government legislation, get hit with TV adverts on meat eating, and we're just constantly exercising this bicep. And then once you start seeing the truth, you, you, you put it down and it starts weakening and eventually, you know, it, it goes back to its original state, you know? And this is, how, I hope this makes sense because I'm just trying to, trying to, I haven't read most of these before I, before I think, um, so yeah, it, it's a very, very sort of solid barrier to, to, to get through, to get through to people, and of course also, humans are innately, innately lazy, and we don't, we like, this is why we're so inventive, because we're so lazy, we invent things to make things easier for ourselves. This is why why we started farming. Um, not only was it to get food, but once we started farming, we had more free time. You know, so we're very so we don't like change. We, humans don't like change. So you, you're hitting. You're trying to get humans to see the light and realize what they're doing in life is wrong. You've got a lot of barriers, you've got a lot of bicep to sort of sort of get through before before they'll realise. So you've got you've got the innate laziness that they don't want to change. It's too much effort. You've got the fact that they've been lied to about about the health reasoning. And if if a human is healthy, they ain't gonna change. Most people who turn vegan later in life or turn plant-based later in life, I've had a warning, something's happened to them. Like my mum. My mum's had... I've, oh, I've got a ringer, actually. My mum's had a mini-stroke. And now, all of a sudden, she wants me to get vegan cheese. She wants me to... She, she's eating less and less meat. Now, all of a sudden, that's scar. And I sh that's a tough one. That's a tough one, you know? People shouldn't wait until they get ill. But that's another, another reason. And if they're healthy... They're not going to change. And then the the animals themselves, we, we're taught that they're food and that's another barrier. So, so no, what I would say logically vegan is that once you plant a seed in someone's head, once you tell a person the truth, if they're not a psychopath, it will gestate and it will grow in the brain. And eventually, it might be 20 years, it might be instantly, they'll get that connection and they'll make a change. But I don't think we're spitting in the wind. I mean, statistics tell us this. We, we, the percentages are flying. We, it's 300% veganism is rising every year now. And it's just snowballing. It's not going to stop. 
because it's not something it's not a fad diet that will die out and yeah so yeah that was a yeah it's given me a lot to think about that i'm gonna have a, have a good think about that what you said um but yeah recognizing them more like us yeah our numbers are gonna rise mate definitely definitely cut down the road you've not got a job yet then okay james bond and jason bourne who would win in a fight and which one are you right so you've got james bond with all his gadgets and everything and then you've got jason bourne who is more of a a working class lad yeah so you've got james bond the fucking tough and you've got jason bourne the working class class um guy um now in this fight it just depends which gadgets james bond's brought with him because jason bourne he can he can get a piece of paper right and he can use that as a weapon <clears throat> or even even uh where's my pen even a ballpoint pen you know what i mean he's like he's a dirty fighter but if james bond manages to get and press that button on his watch that fires a rocket out and that goes into his temple and blows his head up then jason bourne would have it but i think i think if jason bourne was quick and he had bits and bats around him like pencils and and, and and newspapers and everything that he'd kick james bond's ass because jason bourne is like 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 if you can imagine him in the schoolyard james bond would be like um, okay queensbury rules yeah but as soon as James Bond would get his fists up, Jason Bourne will have kicked him in the bollocks and he'd be on the ground and then he'd pull his head down, knee him in the face and then slam him down on the floor and then punch him in the neck. So I think Jason Bourne would win and I'd be Jason Bourne. <laughs> Thanks, Kat. Bev Llewellyn. If you travel around the world against the sun, will you eventually become younger? When you say against the sun, do you mean following the sun or going away from the sun? I'd, well, if you're going towards the sun, you wouldn't become younger because the sun would like age your skin quicker, so you'd become older. If you were going away from the sun, you see, no, 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 that, that doesn't work. However, however, if you can get to a black hole and... If you can get into orbit around the event horizon without going into the black hole, right? They reckon that time will slow down so that every year you spend orbiting this black hole, back on Earth, the guys, everybody here will age seven years. So if you... I'm going to have to do some maths here, aren't I? <laughs> I'm going to calculate it. So if you... If you um, if if you oh shit oh, if you um if you spent seven years going round fuck seven times so if you spent seven years going round a black hole when you got back to Earth the Earth will have aged forty nine years but you will have only aged seven. So, uh, oh, I don't know what I'm talking about sometimes. I do. But that apparently that's right, that's right. Seven year, they reckon you, you know, oh. Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> oh God. Bev, Bev Llewellyn again. Bev, you're getting worse than Kat. You need to get a job as well. How many roads must a man walk down before they call him a man? Are you quoting songs here? Right. How many roads must, must a man walk down before they... Well, I'll tell you what. Some of the roads here on the moors. If you can walk up some of them in a day, I'll call you a man. They're like that. 
Don't go on them there moors. What is love? Baby, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me no more. Yeah, you are, Bev, aren't you? You're quoting, you're quoting bleeding songs, aren't you? It's not funny. This is supposed to be a serious channel. Love is, love is, uh, love is something that gets you into slavery. It means that you get beholden to someone. And you have to be nice all the time. Bev Llewellyn again, would you eat a sea sponge? Okay, so, right, so a, a sea sponge hasn't got a brain or a central nervous system and it it can't feel pain. Would I eat it? Why would I? Why would I? It's a living thing. Why would I eat it? There's no reason to. I don't even live near the sea. So unless I was really, really desperate and there was nothing else to eat, no, I wouldn't eat a sea sponge. I wouldn't even buy one to wash with. You can get loofahs, can't you? They're plants. Just get a get a loofah. Bev. Llewellyn, again. Where does the hour go when the clocks go back? Well, they save them up and uh, they go towards the leap year. They add them all up and they go towards the leap year. That's where the leap year, that's where that extra day comes from in February. Um... Grumpy Vegan Grandad, this is cut down the road again. What is the mean, meaning of life? Please tell me. <sighs> the meaning of life for humans, for us all, is to don't obey the rules, test them. Cause as much trouble to meat eaters as you possibly can. And go out with a bang. That's the meaning of life. Bev Llewellyn. Oh, it seems like a little bit of a Bev Llewellyn. This is the Bev Llewellyn show at the moment. Has Bono found what he's looking for yet? Yeah, he was looking for the Angel of Harlem and his founder. She was in Harlem. If Jack Spratt could eat no fat and his wife could eat no lean, how long could this low fat versus keto relationship realistically last? <laughs> Right, if Jack Spratt could eat no fat, so that means he'd, he'd, he'd be leaner, and his wife could eat no lean, so she'd be fat. Um, I think he could last because a lot of a lot of big women tend to have have skinny boyfriends, don't they? They call them do they call them chubby chasers? <laughs> so I think the the relationship would last a long time. Until, of course, one of them died of uh, heart disease or stroke or whatever, or cancer, because the diet, that diet is shite. Oh, my God. What do you do all day, Bev? Another one. If ifs and ands were pots and pans, how much would a casserole dish be worth? Well, I've done some research, and some certain casserole dishes are worth quite a lot on eBay. Um, have a look at this one here. Bev, how much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? How much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? Um, it just depends. If they've been trained and working out or they have plenty of protein, um, I reckon a woodchuck could chuck wood quite a fair distance. Um, just depends, really. just depends. It depends on the size of the wood and the size of the woodchuck. That's chucking wood. Thanks for that question. Oh, Bev again. Chicken, egg, which is first? I don't care. Grumpy Gramps. Bohemian bee, hello, bohemian bee. I don't know why I always do that when, you, when you're... Hello, bohemian bee. It just, it just, it just, the same bohemian bee just makes you go bohemian bee. Grumpy Gramps, I am being cheeky and asking too. That's what I ask as many as you want. Look at Bev Llewellyn. Bev, I've got no life sitting in the house all day behind my computer screen typing shite questions to Grumpy Vegan Grandad, Bev Llewellyn. Grumpy Gramps, I'm being cheeky and asking too. Your channel tune is hardcore. Did you create it? If not, who did? Um, it was, it is, 
Um, can I see? Let me. It's called Go Let's by the Slaves, and it's it's free with the software. So, um, yeah, no, I didn't create it. It's nothing to do with the merchandise. When are you going to start selling your fair ethical T-shirt? Your fair. So ethical t-shirts with my face on. <clears throat> nah. I'm thinking about trying to brand it and trying to get some nice, clever, clever logos maybe just to get try and get the message across. I'll have a think about that in the future. But at the moment, I've got no plans for t-shirts. However, if you want to get your own t-shirt printed with my face on, then so be it. Expect a punch in the face. <laughs> Well, listen, it's been really, really good to interact with you guys. Um, thanks for following me. Thanks for subscribing. Please, if you're new to the channel, hit a like on the video and subscribe. It won't cost you anything yet. Save the animals. Save the planet. Save yourself. Go vegan. Grumpy Vegan Grandad. Signing out.